which of course has changed narratives. We're looking at the uh, how African nations can take advantage of the recent scramble for Africa. Dr. Nick Moyam, you are an educationist and an entrepreneur. We look at the recent scramble for Africa, Russia, is that the corridors, France, the USA, each of them are struggling to see how they can rally support for themselves. Africa, it's actually blessed with abundant natural resources, but this, uh, we're still suffering from what is known as the mineral curse. And at this time, Africans, many believe, uh, were sustained with uh, food or wheat from Russia and Ukraine, and we're having a food crisis, but then our soils are fertile. When you look at how these big nations are now rushing to Africa, maybe to secure uh, hydrocarbon, fuel, and all the rest, how do you think we can take advantage of this situation? Uh, thank you very much. I think the subject we are entering into now is one of my best subjects. And uh, I just hope that everyone who is listening to me in Africa, beyond Africa, as long as you are African, pay a lot of attention to what I'm saying now. And I hope you just give me a couple of minutes to be able to understand what Africans should do. What can Africans do is about doing. It's not about talking. It's about doing. And for 60 years, there's something we have not been doing. That is what is messing us up, the inability to do. And until we correct and get that ability to do, we will be slaves. And if you see what is happening now, if we as Africans don't wake up and find out that thing that we were not doing properly and start doing it, it doesn't matter how many novenas we have, it doesn't matter how much we praise the, the, the West, the this, the that, and so on, we are going nowhere. Your victory, your solutions, your well-being is in your hands. Let me reframe what I'm trying to say. You know that the African is the scum of the earth. He's not respected anywhere by anybody in the, in the world. He's not respected by whites. He's not respected by, by, by those East um, Asian Muslims. He's not respected by the Chinese and the other Asians. He's, respect, he's not respected by the yellow people, the green people, the white people, or whatever. And you would think that the problem is because of the black color. No. It, we just happen to be black. And therefore, they would hate us. Hmm? Hate us. And you would think that they hate you because you are black. And you think that if you were to, to rub on some creams and be white, they would love you. No. The problem is not with color. They are just taking advantage. If you want to understand very well, see a black man, a black um, American, who is very successful and very powerful, and you see how he's being respected. See how Dangote is being respected. See how Alaji Baba Dangpolo is being respected. It's about capacity. It is about capacity. What God has blessed you, let me say it another way. Africa is the richest continent on the earth and God has put us in this garden of Eden. But unfortunately, as a people, we don't know what to do with our riches. That is our problem. And then we leave the riches and we are running to other people's countries who have nothing and we abandon that and then they are coming for it. So there is this scramble, and why are we not asking ourselves if we are running away and dying in the Mediterranean Sea and dying all over, going through Nicaragua or whatever to go to America, why is it that they are coming and we are running away? The problem is very simple, very, very simple. And let me explain again what, what makes countries work. It's a principle. There are three things that make a nation work, or any organization for that matter. Number one, the first thing is your pub is your is, is, is politics, the policies and so on. That's the mind that makes things happen. Number two is the economics. I said economics. And we have we fail woefully at economics. We don't understand 
anything about economics and wealth creation and the use of that wealth. We are, we are total failures, hopeless. Then the third thing is development. And when we are talking about development, we are making reference to, 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 to two types of, to two things that constitute the development. Development of the physical space, you are talking about communication, you are talking about roads, airports, housing, and what have you, hospital care. That's just one thing. But the most important element in all the things I've been trying to say is the development of the human capacity of the human person. And we are talking about the development of our youths. And that is where the problem is. That is where we failed. And after our independence, the white man was very intelligent. He realized that if the youths of these African countries are not smart, we can always come back and steal what we want. And therefore, they gave you a kind of education which was hopeless. And like I said, these three things, politics, the, if you want to have good politics, if you want to have a good economics, if you want to have good development, you must have people who have been properly educated. It's about education, which means that if your education is the wrong type, you have failed before you even started. Don't mind, you can have PhDs in this, 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 you are just telling histories and so on, and you don't know the formula of water. You don't know how to get water purified. You don't know how to change your own minerals. You don't know how to handle that. You are going to be colonized by the Chinese, whether you like it or not. So they are coming. It's not like they will not come. They are coming, and you have only one weapon against them. The weapon is to change your school system, train your own youths, Give authorization or give your power to the, your children who have gone to the diaspora. Let them come and build your own economies and do it themselves. So that the Chinese man doesn't come to your, to, to, your, to your house and enter your bedroom. When the Chinese man is coming, he deals with your children in the parlor. And it's your children to take what they, what they want to take and give them and they go away. But if you call them to come and go to, your, to their bushes and cut your own tree trunks and take them raw as they are doing now, you will be poor. You will be a beggar. And they will take over you, and you will be forced to align whether with the east or the west. You know, I listened to, Prof to, 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 to President, um, uh, the president of Uganda the other day. He was saying that he aligns neither with the west nor the east. He aligns with himself. To align with them yourself means build your own capacity and do your own things yourself and have your own brain. That is industrialization, technology, e uh, technology, uh, um, engineering. Do things yourself. DIY is the word. No DIY, you are dead. And uh, we go to Dr. Ligmoyam. Mm -hmm. Mr. Five is uh, Africa is witnessing a new form of uh, scramble. The West is crisscrossing uh, France, this year, uh, Russia, the USA, each of them is struggling to rally support. and has come to the time where many believe that Africa is only dependent uh, to the West, but we're now realizing that the West is now coming to Africa to rally support. How do we benefit or how do we take advantage of this new scramble or is it going to be again on our detriment? Well, the scramble for Africa is taking another dimension. We understand what happened in 1884 in the Berlin West African Conference where they came to an agreement that instead of us fighting and belittling ourselves in front of those blacks, we should agree that you take this territory, you take this zone, and I take this one. And if I have to come into this your own area, I can discuss with you and we do an exchange for benefits on the ground. It's too bad. That is slavery and slave trade. They should hear us very well. But the new scrap of Africa is coming at a time when the dynamics within the West is, and the center is no longer holding. And yet, the African leaders have still decided to mortgage the future of Africans. First, I was amongst those who were against the fact that African leaders, puppets, masterminded and put in place by the West, will sit and hear a single country, whether West, Europe, or Asia, whole Africa and the country summit. Japan, Africa summit. China, Africa summit. France, Africa. This is madness. 
that a single country sits and convenes a meeting, calling the entire continent to come to him. Chairman, there is madness on the African continent. You sit in a comfortable zone and delegate over 50 African head of state to come and see you when you are the one reaping from their natural resources. This is witchcraft in broad daylight. I was expecting that China, Japan, or whether Russia, whatever, who want to hold a meeting should come and see us where we are. It would have been better if we said that going around the all 54 African countries might be difficult. Maybe we take block. West African countries meet in Ghana. This area east meet in Tanzania. North African countries meet in Cairo or whatever. It could have made a little bit of sense. But to say you bundle us, lazy leaders who have nothing to offer, and they carry their wallets and move and sit, and one man is champion a meeting of over 50 head of states, it is madness. So with a new wave for the scramble of Africa, two advantages are possible. Because if they start coming back, it's because the initial scramble agreement, as per 1884 of the Berlin West African Conference, is already crumbling. Because the dynamics have changed. That's why they're coming back to take new steps to make sure that the grip they had on us during the 19th centuries, as it is losing, they should come back and tie it, and this time tie it harder. Because we are becoming intelligent than them. It will not work. Where's here? And all these African leaders, what are they called them presidents, who don't have anything to offer, we will unseat all of you. So, the way forward is the advantage. Two hypotheses are possible. One, that those who come in, the African leaders, even though we don't even have them, because there are two odd of them, there's nothing to offer. But if we had good African leaders like Paul Gagame, all right, they could decide to talk with them. If you want to come in, please, conditions. Transfer of technology. Look at Cameroon, Mr. Luis. Over 75,000 computers. The VR computer, whatever. But this institute has one of them, has them too. Dr. Mick benefited from them in their numbers. And he's not saying anything. He's not even asking the government, how do you spend billions to pay for laptops that the Minister of Higher Education says is, is 32 gig? And you see, I'm giving this to, uh, to, to students. And that if Dr. Lee's students who are doing agriculture can even use that laptop to carry out one experimental assignment as per se, in terms of storing information to carry out. In short, let me not talk much. So, Mr. Luis, if we have useful governments, they can tell them to transfer technology. When Volkswagen got to Rwanda and they told Paul Kagame, we want to carry on development in your area, we want, to, we, want, we want to build, we want you, we want to build the company in your area. President Paul Kagame told them, you could build it, but on conditions that the top management of your company will be Rwandans. Why is it so? Because he wanted them to start seeing how they are assembling those things, so that you will understand so that at the time that their budget expires, Rwanda now will be, will be producing cars similar to Volkswagen. Of course, we understand that even in their space station, they have satellite, Rwandan satellite. How did it happen? Transfer of technology. If you are coming to Scramble for Africa, come here, but make sure that the 75,000 computers we had, Dr. Lee would have told his government that place. We would love it. But would you mind bringing the, the factory in Yaoundé, Ndolemonduka? or wherever, even in Dr. village in Kambe, so that you start bringing this computer with us here, with local engineers in the country. By the time you finish building, Kamara already know how to build a computer. When you are going, you, when you are returning after the contract, Kamara has now a computer uh, manufacturing uh, uh, industry. But because those who man these powers are sleeping, they are sleeping dogs, they have expired, all of them, they have expired. See where we are today. So, second possibility, Luis, is I have my friend there from Leeds, what is Leeds University? He's a researcher. I told him something on this platform. Team up yourselves there in the diaspora. 
These guys are very intelligent and they have the financial capability. Team of yourself return to the countries where you come from. So when you return, when your donor is talking about agriculture at St. Louis, bring that knowledge of agriculture, of mechanized agriculture there into the school. From there, we have practical centers in Bengui, practical centers in Betwa, practical centers in Maiduguri. Before we know it, we will not be saying that there's war in Ukraine and then there's no wheat. No. We're producing enough wheat that we will be tell, we'll be not to tell Russia, come and buy wheat from us. I don't know how it's functioning. People are screaming for Africa and just what they are watching. Because the man over there will tell you that he is earning probably $20,000 per month. I should not see why he should come. But when Jeronis came to Ghana, what happened? He simply advised the Ghanaians who were in the diaspora, we know you are living well, but for the sake of bringing up Ghana, please, will you mind transferring? Medical doctors, we can pay you half of the salary. We give you an occupation if you can help us. Many who came explains why Ghana started coming out of the economic quagmire. We had even Shubendas. I had even a teacher who taught me at CPC Bali, who was a Ghanaian, a physician. Very intelligent. But they had left. And when that issue came in, he went back to his country and was well placed from Cameroon. So you cannot realize that if diaspora, my, the, my friend of Leeds, my brother, pack your bags, take another crusade to Asia, America, and everything. Tell those engineers, physicians, chemists, and whatever. When they come, with the money first, the government will, will bow. Because when you bring money that is above that of the government, you can easily force your way in and you install. We have a man called, um, I don't know the name, but his church would not call Afro Brains, Cameroon. I don't know his name. Okay, maybe the, Dr. Tata. Dr. Tata, Dr. Tata, a man who has studied in China on food issues. And he realized that we have cassava, we have cocoa yams, and all these things are still manually prepared. He came with the technology of how to transform cocoa, cocoa yam. That we will prepare a chew with cocoa yam flour, soya beans, soya beans flour, this, that, that. And now people can take powder cocoa yam. You just turn it like that with hot water, and you have a chew, which will go through the stress of pounding and pounding and pounding. This is transfer of technology. What are those diasporas doing there? Apart from blowing hot grammar in the air. Well, man, well, man, well, man, what's up? Prepare your bags because I will talk with those that, the powers that be. We send a chartered plane to Shanghai, Pekin. We move to Florida, wherever all of you are. Free flight to Cameroon. Thank you. We give, we have enough land, eh, Mr. Luis? Right. We have enough land. We give you enough land. We carve an area and put there jasperants in Cameroon. We can build you free house, low cost housing, eh? Stay there, don't pay. But begin the technology, and before we know it, we will no longer look, look for these guys. Because once we become transferring technology that we have acquired, for over the years in the diaspora, the West will begin to beg for us. Before then, they will start applying for visa to come to Cameroon. And when we look at the visa, no, 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 man. No, Judge Mike, this from Australia. No, wait first, we don't want you. These are things that my brother should do. That's lesson. If I don't see it starting with my brother who is with us in this planet, he will hear from me very soon. Thank you. Uh, Elijah, thank you. Um, Mr. Five, thanks very much. Mr. Elijah, we are up to you now. And uh, just like we'll say, talking about this Camouflage Africa, it's reported that uh, Blinken will definitely or certainly be visiting some African countries in August. And uh, this is uh, the time when we're seeing different uh, Western paths crisscrossing different corridors in African countries. To rally support, how do we take advantage of this scramble for Africa? What do you think we can do? Is it going to be at our detriment again? Or do you think we can actually benefit from this scramble we are witnessing? Uh, Mr. Lewis and the panelists, um, I want first of all <laughs> address my big brother, Mr. Fai. <laughs> he has addressed me on so many occasions in this platform. And I've said that um, I take him on his challenge. Um, after my research, my plan is to return to home. So um, I take him on his challenge. So we will talk behind the scene after that. So, but again, let's go to the subject of discussion. I want to make sure that uh, we Africans, particularly, we are actually hitting uh, the bull on the head on this issue. 
because unfortunately what I seem to perceive is like the pain of colonization that Africa has gone through is making us to instead blind ourselves and simply make enemies and not even think through the strategies that we are going into when it comes to who is coming on our doors or who is knocking on our doors for contracts or whatever it is. Now, let me be very clear on this. We understand that Europe and the rest and, I, and America and the rest that colonized, I, I wouldn't say America, but Europe particularly that colonized Africa inflicted a lot of pain on the continent of Africa. And that has left bitter taste on the mouth of Africa in such a way that any Tom, Dick and Harry that comes through the door now, that seems to be a counterfeit or maybe in confrontational motto, the West, we are ready to open our doors even without preconditions. If you listen to what you were, you present, uh, Museveni said, he said, uh, Russia did not colonize us. Why should we have any issues with Russia? Why should we do this? Why should we, do? We should open the door? So what he is simply saying is echoing the tone of a lot of African countries that think that because the West colonized us, we know the pain that we went through. There's no doubt about that. We should simply open the doors to East, Russia, China, and the rest, even without preconditions. And that is what I am saying on the African continent. You find African continent going into loans with China, loans that are signed for 99 years, precarious, ludicrous, satanic, diabolic loans, all because, you know, the West has been oppressing Africa and we have this newfound love with the West and we're opening up everything that comes to our doors and want to open to the economy to them. Number two, uh, Mr. Elvis and also Dr. Uh, Dr. Nick mentioned the transfer of technology. And I want to come in to use that point so that we educate ourselves here. If you find a country like China, I have no issue with China. I have no problem with China. They are doing a lot of businesses in Africa. But what is Chinese policy? Chinese policy is the one that will come with every single technology that they have. They will bring a Chinese company that's operating in Cameroon will bring spoons from China, knives from China, ports from China, mattresses from China, cleaning dishes from China, napkins from China, people that are working in the kitchen from China, cooks from China. And these are the kind of policies that Cameroon government, or let me say African government is signing with Western powers. Where is the transfer of technology that somebody talked about here? What is it? It's missing because everything comes from China. Everything is taken back to China. There's no transfer of technology. Let's talk about the agricultural sector. Africa has 30, I mean, 40 percent of the world's arable land. And that is a sector that Africa can exploit. And what do we find? We find Western industries that come to Africa and they bring whatever products they are bringing even free of tariffs, and they dump it on the African soil. How do you ex expect that product to compete with the local product that goes through every single thing from paying workers, everything? How do you expect that product? And African governments are afraid to put a tariff on the foreign product that is coming to compete with the local product, and therefore they'll kill the local industry. That is what happened to the mosquito industry in Africa. For those who that might not know. The mosquito net was a booming industry in Africa. Some African government said, well, we need to put a tariff on every foreign mosquito net that is coming from the West because we have local industries that are producing this thing. In order to you know, protect our local industry, we need to put a tariff. The West protested. What did African countries do? They yielded. So if you do not provide an enabling environment for the local industry to to, 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 to to prosper and you open up the market the way it is right now, how do you expect the local industry to prevail? Number three, what kind of accords are African leaders signing with the so-called ease that is coming in? Let's take Russia for example. More than 80% of the accords that have been signed between African leaders and Russia are military. It's been called arms for minerals. You don't find agricultural 
accords. You don't find technological accords. You don't find educational accords. You don't find that. You find military accords that African nations are signing to maintain dictators in power. That is why Africa is losing. We have an opportunity here to be the kingmaker. We have America that's trying to come in. We have Europeans that are trying to come in. And we have the East. Instead of taking advantage to say, hey, we have all these powers that are trying to come to Africa now. We have an opportunity to become kingmaker. What do you have? Like what Mr. Uh, Mr. Alvin mentioned, you have Rwanda, for example. As we speak, Rwanda is about to start producing gas from Le Kivu. That is a country that is having no resources, but the little that they have, they will milk it out. Why did they do it? They say, okay, the Western world, we know that you have the technology. We are going to trade with you. We are going to do this. But in exchange, you have to teach our children. As we are speaking, there is a car manufacturing company in Rwanda. As we are speaking, there is a cell phone manufacturing company in Rwanda, and it's being manned by Rwandans. Remember, this is a country that just went through the genocide. And it's a country that just transformed from the French system of education to the English system of education not long ago. They are South Africans, even Cameroonians of English-speaking expression that are going to Rwanda to teach as we're speaking today. Why can't the rest of African countries go into such deals? The so-called Yuweri uh, Museveni that we are talking about, that is a country that signed its own known airport to the Exim Bank of China. As we are speaking, they failed to pay the loan, and the Exim Bank of China almost confiscated that airport. Are those the kind of accords that we want to sign with the East? I would say no. So African leaders must take strategic decisions when we have these foreign powers coming in now. Otherwise, we will be in for the Berlin Conference 2.0. Africa will be recolonized in a way, and we're seeing it happening. I mentioned China, and I said it without mincing words. What China is doing in Africa today is unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And I do not understand how African governments would sign such an accord where every single thing that goes into that country comes from China, and the local industries have no benefit. Who gains from that? It is not the Cameroon, I mean, uh, African uh, 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 populace. It is the powers that be, because they know what they're doing. They know what they're benefiting. Corruption and nepotism. And let me mention this before I give you back the microphone. A lot of uh, African friends, especially the, in, the, in the intelligentsia, they say, well, the West have been colonized, they have colonized Africa, and they have done this and they done this. There's no can say about this. Yes, we feel the pain of colonization. In Cameroon, for example, we just talked about the issue in the Northwest and the Southwest. When the Security Council wanted to bring the discussion of the issue in Cameroon for discussion, who vetoed it? It's Russia. So is that the person you want to go into agreement with? Who does not care about human rights, who does not care about what's going on in the country, is only out to negotiate military accord with the dictators that be in power? Africa needs to think strategically. Again, in diplomacy, there is no permanent enemies or permanent friends. They are only permanent interests. If we see where the African interest is being served correctly, whether it is Russia, of course we go in for it. Whether it is China, of course we go in for it. Whether it is France, of course, even though they colonize us, if we have a good accord with them that is going to serve the interests of Cameroonians, not some oligarch in power that are going to you know, benefit their family or whatnot, why not? Let us not allow our pain of colonization blind us to good deals that might come our way and say, we are just opening the door to the East because they never colonize us. That is the wrong way of thinking. We should open up and become like a kingmaker. A comes to the table, B comes to the table. What do you have? How does it benefit our people? If it benefits our people, let's go in for it. Thank you very much, uh, Elijah Inuku. Dr. Nigwanyam, just the last word, we're wrapping up. We had two topics for discussion. Uh, <laughs> Elvis Bandel, sorry. Uh, <laughs> we're up to you, uh, Elvis. Uh, yes. Elvis. Well, I'm, yeah, I'm with you. you. 
We're looking at the scramble for Africa, and uh, of course, that's our topic for the second topic we're looking at uh, at this point in time. And the question is, how do we take advantage of this uh, recent scramble, taking into consideration that we have uh, these big nations rushing into different African countries? Is it at our detriment, or do you think we can actually benefit from this uh, recent scramble, knowing that the West cannot do without Africa? Okay, before I answer the question as to how do we benefit from the scramble, permit me begin by telling you that just the word scramble in itself is already a problem to Africa. The word scramble is already a problem to me because when you look at all the possible definitions of the word scramble, you realize that if the scrambling is taking place on the African soil, of course, the person to pay the price is the African. Because when you scramble, there is force that is used. And if the force is used, it's on the African territory. We are the ones to pay the price. When you scramble, you do things in a haste, and so there are so many mistakes. And if the mistakes are being made, it's on the African territory. Who pays the price? It is the African. So when we talk about scrambling in the, in, in the general sense of the word scramble, first and foremost, I will tell you already, it is already something very, very bad for Africa. But now, the other way around, given that the scramblers who are coming to Africa today, the same who were there yesterday, they are coming today in a different form, in another way. Coming this time around, not with guns, but under the guise of bilateral corporations and business deals and all whatnot, I want to think that it all depends on the leadership that we have in Africa today. If we have good leadership, if we have good governance with good policies, then I want to think that Africa can transform today's scramble to their own advantage if we place reason at the head of everything, if we place patriotism before everything. The last speaker before me just mentioned something. People going in to sign a, a, accord, a military accord. You realize that these are leaders who have their personal interests and they prefer to sign accords to protect themselves in power. They are not signing accords that will benefit their continent. They are not signing accords that will benefit their different countries. But they are looking at their personal interests in the accords that they sign. Whereas, like many have said before, the, uh, maybe they, they simply took some of the ideas I had. I would say that. If you were to sign an accord with any European country, for instance, take, let me say, uh, uh, the, 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 the forestry. Tell any country that, okay, if you are coming into maybe the south region of my country to fell down wood, to expel the wood there, we simply give you a condition. For instance, we know that, okay, we are going to sign an accord for 10 years. Within these 10 years, these are the nature of roads we want you to construct within, the, within that region. These are the type of schools and hospitals we will want you to construct. In other words, we should not go for contracts when we, we, we exchange our raw material for physical cash. Because we know the type of people we have in this country, in Africa. Most of our leaders are thieves. Permit me use the word thieves. You see, when they sign in exchange for raw cash, the raw cash ends in the pockets of a few people and therefore doesn't benefit the entire country. But if you give them those conditions, that if you are coming to expel gold, to mine gold in a particular region of the country, okay, one, you must give us this quality of roads within this time frame. You must give us this nature of schools within this time frame. And you realize at the end of the day, they will not just, in terms of technology like other panels have mentioned, develop our country progressively and gradually, but at one point in time, they will indirectly be creating employment for our people. Because if you were to come and construct schools as agreed in an accord, automatically we shall need uh, uh, medical doctors to, 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 to handle those hospitals. And now in another accord, you can simply give them a condition to do what? To build a good medical training center for the country. Unfortunately, we have leaders who do not think in this line. They rather think about themselves first, themselves second, and themselves third, and they forget about the country. So I just want to think that there is a possibility that we should benefit from this new scramble, though I hate the word scramble, because when they are scrambling, they give the impression that they are coming to help us, when in reality they are coming to salvage their own situation. But now, let's go by the word scramble still. We can transform this new scramble into our own advantage if and only if the new or the, 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 the present leadership will change their way of viewing things and become more patriotic than being so uh, uh, self-centered because that is the major thing we have in our African countries today. Then the issue of governance to corruption. Like I say, we should not even accept accords where raw materials are exchanged for raw cash because our leaders here take the money and then go back to bank kicks. 
in banks in the same countries again. And of course, we know even when you leave power or you die, that money never comes back. Or even when you start the money there and you are still in government, how does it therefore benefit your community? It doesn't in any way. So I think that there is actually a possibility for us to benefit from the new scramble, but we need to be very, very wise. Mr. Elijah, the last speaker just mentioned something. We should know the type of accords we are signing and the areas of the accords. Dr. Nick mentioned it. I think technology today is what Africans need. And when I say technology, I mean technology in all the different walks of life. Be it um, uh, in agriculture or any area of life, we need the Western technology because the truth is they have gone far beyond us. Someone mentioned the idea of Chinese, for instance, who come and sign accords here, the win contract, and they bring practically even the laborers from their own country. It is like the same thing back here in my country, Cameroon. You give people a contract to build a stadium in your country, but they import even the block, Mr. Biben, right from, 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 from Italy to come and build here. Does it mean that the sun, the cement we have, it could not produce blocks? That is the question. So we should sign accords, taking into consideration the interest of our people, the interest of the state in general. Elvis, uh, Dr. Nick Moyam, we are wrapping up your closing statement. We have two topics for discussion Cameron, visit of Macron, and uh, the scramble of Africa. Minister, I have to conclude that on this second topic because it's very, very important. And to say that, you know, when we use the, the word independence, interdependence, and dependence, True independence is economic independence, and that economic independence, you only get it yourself. Nobody can give you economic independence. It's you and your children who must have it by acquiring it and doing it yourself. And you only get it not by selling raw materials. You get it through acquiring technology, Acquiring doesn't mean that you go and bring Chinese to do it for you. No. Your own children must learn the technology and must learn the engineering and solve the problems themselves. That is the only time that you can talk of independence. Therefore, real independence is only acquired when you have economic independence through industry, through technology, and, uh, and the good leadership entrepreneurship, wealth creation. If you don't have that, you will be dependent. It doesn't matter what you do. And as long as you are de dependent, though you are walking around and celebrating every first, first uh, January uh, that you are independent, you are not. You are just deceiving yourself. That thing is deceit. The real independence is not that thing that we got in 1960. The real independence is something that you acquire yourself, and you acquire it when you want. So in Cameroon, when we are saying that we would, we would emerge by 2035, if we actually understood what it means, we are, we, we are saying that we will be independent by 2035. And that independence is not something that you say. It's something that you do. If you don't do the right thing, 2035 will come and you will still be a very great slave. Uh, we began by saying that Cameroon had a lot of news making events uh, over the week, which you saw the release of uh, what we call a state thief. And... Uh, we have two topics for the day as well, the visit of Macron and as well the Scramble for Africa, your closing statement. Well, I saw one conversation with the release of uh, former Minister of Water, Mines and Energy, uh, Basila Kandalakuna, uh, on instructions from the um, head of state, you put instructions to show the data as the Kangaroo system functions always on that. So, no, they made another is like. You know, in any kangaroo system, the executive commands the judiciary and the legislative. It's automatic in any dictatorial regime. So, the supreme power does not, it's not in the agenda of, uh, of, of a dictatorial regime. It's not there. Uh, I think that one is that one. I, I doubt probably there are some VIP prisoners who are somewhat more important than the others. Others can get direct instruction from the head of state, while others have to just be there, whether they are going up and down. So, all in all, but to crowd a story, We'll be looking at the government that puts in place the new system in Korea and in China, whereby as you steal state budget, it's assumed that you are causing havoc because it has been used to save the life of people or ameliorate an economic activity in the country in one way or the other. 
as you are caught on as of investment firing squad or hanging if we have that law all these state thieves will disappear in borderline well on the topic for today i think i'm happy that i took part in it uh on the issues of scramble for africa i think that if africans build a good government governance governor system uh with a good military that could protect the country and their sovereignty and then they put in place their own currency i repeat their own currency we can never be independent so long as we our foreign reserves are in france that one will be another we'll be discussed for another day it can never happen as long as we keep borrowing when imf gives you money when the, the world bank gives you money they give you money with quotes because they tell you we need to understand how your economy functions by so doing they monitor us that what they call evil spirits we call them monitoring spirit so as a monitor they see where we are weak and they will never love to afford technology because you should always be poor so you come and beg when you beg then as they're assisting you they give you other stuff uh, stuff conditions which at the end you have you become vulnerable in dishing out your raw, your raw materials for free for those rascals i think it will not move not long from now last statement all the dictators on the african continent prepare your bags whether you are in cameroon whether you wherever you are prepare your bags a bad dictator that is somebody who stays long in power against democratic principles like in rwanda is far better like equatorial guinea obiana bazo stays has been on for long but the fact that equatorial guinean first before any other thing and you see what is going on in bata malabo and the other areas in equatorial guinea tells you that better you have someone who stays long in power and has the people at heart than to have spirits that stay in the name of leaders who cannot even remember their names and at the end we keep suffering and we are clapping for a white man who comes about giving a red carpet and garavanting all and all take us back your back because your time is up and dr nick calls them uh, benevolent despot yes <laughs> enlightened benevolent dis <laughs> despots that's what we need in africa okay. enlightened yeah, I like and, that. And benevolent. And benevolent. Yeah. Yeah, you're very right. All yes. right. Uh, Mr. Elijah, your closing statement. We had two topics <coughs> for the day, and possibly what observations you've had equally. Let's say you just uh, la last comments before we close up. Um, my, I have three comments. The first one is for my beloved nation. I'm a Cameroonian. A lot of people might not know I'm a Cameroonian. They see me in other stations. They feel I'm a Nigerian. No, I'm a Cameroonian. For my beloved nation, I want to say this message to the powers that be. The war in the Northwest and Southwest might not be affecting you today. When your children grew up, those guys in the bush, those children who are not able to go to school, those people whose families have been destroyed, those people who are in pain, tomorrow their own children might come after you. So when you think that you are sitting in the under or Dwala, wherever it is, it doesn't concern you one day one day we all might pay the price so it concerns everybody please let us come to a dialogue and resolve this problem in the northwest and southwest that's my message on that one and number two you mentioned something about the release of the minister i think minister of mines and power whatever it is a, a state thief again i want to remind africans that in many prisons and dungeons, you have political, you know, prisoners of conscience, people who have expressed their mind being thrown in jail, but you have armed bandits in the name of ministers being released. It's an unfortunate image of Cameroon and Africa as a whole. And thirdly, on the issue of the scramble for Africa, as we discussed, whatever name you want to use, it's scramble or not, I want to say that the government that we need to provide an enabling environment for the industries to prevail. We know that technology transfer, nobody knows it all. The West has the technology. You have to provide an enabling environment for that technology to be transferred for people. You know, economies that boom. If you look at Rwanda, for example, that we're talking about Rwanda, you look at the level of enticement that Paul Kagame has made to entice those foreign companies to come to their country. You look at their tax system. You look at, uh, you know, it will surprise you. I'm just mentioning this because uh, my elder brother there has been challenging me. It will surprise you to know that some of us have actually applied for some companies to start in Africa, in their own country. If it surprises you know how long and bureaucratic it takes 
to start a single small company, you'll be shocked. That's to say the economy is so corrupt and even to start a small business, there are so many bottlenecks. But that's not to say that we wouldn't do it. The time will come that tables my turn. And please, for the young people, get involved in your country, get involved in the political system, get involved in the economic system, and things will one day change. people getting involved in the politics uh, of course is very important and we're going to resound that again uh, mr elvis let's hear from you your closing statement we had two topics of discussion and possibly your comments and uh, your observations from your own day political capitals of cameroon okay um uh, what i can say with respect to the first topic is that i will call on the um, uh, cameroonians to understand that we have a political problem at hand which can be solved politically and not through the barrel of the gun. That's the first thing. Secondly, we should understand that it is not for France to, should I say, dictate to us, hand down to us what we have to implement as a solution. France can only come in as an advisor, but if France proposes an idea, advises, and we judge that that advice cannot hold, then nothing obliges us to stick to it. And that's why we always started by saying what Macron is proposing as of now, um, uh, decentralization is something that cannot apply. So we simply wave it off and then we go to for what we think as a people can apply in our situation. Thirdly, I would say there is a need for inclusive, genuine dialogue where people will be allowed to express their political views freely and no one will be thereafter intimidated or thrown to jail because of his political views. Now, talking about the second topic on the scramble for Africa, though I have made it known already that I even hate the term scramble, what I would simply tell Africans is that we should use it as an opportunity. We should not be so too fast into signing accords, but that Africa should even begin by creating a, an economic block within itself. For instance, when you look at Europe, they have the, the, the European Union. It is not for nothing. These are people who have understood the strength in unity. But unfortunately, Africa still goes and trades as independent countries. Take note of one thing. Even when you see Macron coming to Cameroon, he comes with a, with, with a minister of the European Union. This is to tell you that he's not only coming as France, but he also comes following the principles that have been laid down by the European Union to be able to go for whatever business accord. So African countries should unite themselves form an economic block so that whenever any country is to deal with any European country, you also go by the principles that we must have set together as a people. In that case, we know that we shall have a real bargaining force against any European country that we have to go into business with. And by so doing, I want to think we shall be signing better accords for ourselves that can enable future generations to be able to be proud of us in, 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 in years to come. I think that's what I have to tell Africa today. Jinne Elvis Bane, National Communications Secretary for the Popular Action Party. Thanks very much for your time and being part of the program this afternoon. Mm, pleasure. Yeah, thank you, Ikoli. Uh, Elijah Inwoku, researcher with Leeds University on African Development. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks for being there. We appreciate. And Dr. Nick Mayam, educationist and entrepreneur. We very much appreciate you being there on the program today, Dr. Nick. Thank you. Yeah. And political analyst, thanks for being there on the program this day. Thanks very much for your time. And thank you, equally, those of you who are watching us back at home and those of you who are following us live on Facebook. Thanks very much for being there. We continue observing the situations and evolutions in Africa and different African countries. And we shall be here to discuss more. Thanks for watching. Every broadcast will be yours on Monday, 14 hours GMT, 3 p.m. West African time. On today, we equally appreciate our technicians for the wonderful job. More programs are yours on Afric Media. It's a boy for now. Afrique Media. Le monde, c'est nous.